Have you ever wondered what it takes to successfully raise money? I have worked with hundreds of capital campaigns across dozens of industries, and I'm here to share with you proven methods for raising money in record time and at the lowest cost, while also obtaining capital at the lowest price. My name is Carl Dakin, and welcome to Motivated Money. Hello, this is Carl Dakin. Welcome to this episode of the Motivated Money podcast, where we'll talk about small businesses and entrepreneurs raising capital using my approach to raising capital called Motivated Money. In this series of episodes, uh, I try to share with everyone who's listening uh, different techniques and methods that are based upon selling your company, uh, your equity or debt or anything else that you have to offer to investor candidates who have more to gain from investing because of the fact that they're stakeholders. Stakeholders are people, organizations, government agencies who stand to benefit from the success of your organization before ever making an investment. And so today, uh, as I have in other episodes, I'm going to be presenting without a guest. Uh, this is uh, an informational session, so to speak, where I, I want to get you up to speed on a concept called crowdfunding. Uh, this is a very important change that has occurred in raising capital. Um, it has all kinds of potential, which has been slow to be realized because there are a number of difficulties and challenges in successfully completing a crowdfunding campaign. And I wanted to give you a little bit of background about crowdfunding in today's uh, episode of the Motivated Money podcast because uh, I'm working with a number of entrepreneurs who are using this uh, style of capital campaign. I'm working with different crowdfunding platforms as they try to make their platforms a more accessible way of obtaining capital to entrepreneurs and small businesses. And there are a number of, of key concepts and, and um, I'll call it distinguishing features about raising money through crowdfunding, which are different than what you might see or might expect in a more common way of raising crowdfunding from angel investors. So uh, to begin with, uh, we talk about crowdfunding. Uh, this is a, a key uh, distinction where you have two words, crowd and funding. And one of the things that uh, small businesses have a typical hard time doing is trying to identify uh, who are good investor candidates, who may be uh, suitable people to invest into their company. And uh, through the stakeholder approach that I propose, uh, we are looking for people who are more motivated, most motivated, uh, ones who cannot uh, live without your organization and its success. Uh, people who potentially need your organization to succeed in order for them to fulfill their own mission, to uh, achieve their own goals, to attain their milestones and be successful. And uh, crowdfunding represents uh, one uh, way of getting to a certain group of stakeholders, and these are, are largely your customers. Uh, the people who commonly buy and sell products from you, uh, this may be uh, B2C uh, consumers who are buying a single product at a time. Uh, it may represent B2B where you're selling uh, products and services to another business. But it's a very important um, as a, a way of raising capital because of regulatory changes that started as long ago as 2012, over 10 years ago, um, in that uh, up to that point in time, uh, if you were trying to raise capital through the sale of securities, this is an offering of a promissory note or a stock or a revenue share type of uh, deal structure, uh, your ability to sell to uh, non-wealthy people non-accredited investors as they're, they're termed, 
was very, very limited. And it was so limited that as a practical matter, almost no one was selling uh, to people who did not have a high degree of wealth. And um, during the last recession, that this is the one that preceded today's recession, uh, which is growing and cascading forward at high speed into a, a serious recession next year, um, we found that um, there were not enough employment and uh, the government decided that it wanted to employ ERS, uh, small businesses to start new businesses and to grow new businesses in order to create new jobs. And uh, they passed the um, Crowdfunding Act in 2012, and then um, they handed it off to the US Securities and Exchange Commission who sat on this legislation for four years before completing new regulations uh, that finally allowed uh, this uh, new way of raising capital to take place. Uh, during that time, a lot of states, including Colorado, where uh, I reside, uh, passed their own uh, legislation. And I, I participated in drafting the Colorado Crowdfunding Act in 2015. And the, the idea was to create uh, smaller local campaigns that are limited to the residents of a single state. And, and, and I could go on for a long time about all the regulations that uh, were put in place to protect investors as consumers which largely did little but to increase uh, the regulatory burden, the cost of bookkeeping, and uh, the cost of running a campaign, which still uh, represents a serious challenge to, to conducting a, a crowdfunding campaign today. But the, uh, the key thing is uh, non-accredited investors, these are people who have less than $1 million in net worth who are making less than $200,000 a year, uh, were, were basically uh, kept out of the capital markets uh, because the government, uh, in their wisdom, viewed these people as being incompetent, unsophisticated, and incapable of making uh, investment decisions. And uh, there, uh, there really is no supporting evidence to this e effect, uh, but uh, the greater theory was that people with a lot of money uh, wealthy people could either afford to lose their investment or they could afford to hire uh, an investment advisor to assist them if they were not qualified to make an investment decision. And um, therefore, it was okay. They didn't need as much regulatory oversight as uh, small dollar investors. But crowdfunding uh, kind of turned that whole thinking on its head because we're talking about raising um small dollar investments from a large number of people. Uh, so that's where the term crowd comes from. And uh, at that point, it, it kind of changed the dynamic because uh, if you're asking a person to invest only $100 uh, into a small business in their community, uh, that decision doesn't require any greater sophistication, in fact, requires less sophistication then that same person would use in buying a new house for hundreds of thousands of dollars or buying a new car for tens of thousands of dollars. <clears throat> so why would you know the government uh, justify support uh, continuing to regulate uh, this type of transaction uh, when we're only talking about a, a few hundred dollars? Uh, now, admittedly, you can invest up to thousands of dollars uh, under a very uh, certain conditions, but nonetheless, most people are not going to invest that kind of money. So we, we got into this and we're saying, okay, now we're going to engage in what I call and what most people call equity crowdfunding. And uh, before going further down that path, I want to make some distinctions between other types of crowdfunding you may have heard about. There are three primary types of crowdfunding. One is crowdfunding as a charitable donation where your church or local community or a special fund may be put together to help a family uh, after a fire or to uh, deal with some other kind of uh, local charitable need. And that type of crowdfunding is a gift where if you write a check uh, in a charitable crowdfunding, it's a donation 
and you're not expecting to get anything back for that. A second type of crowdfunding is called rewards crowdfunding. And this is where uh, you place some money with a small business with the expectation that you're going to get a product or service. Uh, you're going to get something of value. And this is kind of like what I, I call a, um, a holiday deferred uh, savings plan, uh, because commonly you will give the money to the company and it will use that money to produce the product that they're going to sell to you. It's not on the shelf. It's not an inventory. And you'll get it uh, later in a layaway plan. And, um, and in this manner, though, uh, you are providing money uh, to a company, but it's a sale. It's a one-time transaction. You may provide the money to the company, never think of them again. You don't establish a long-term relationship. The type of crowdfunding I'm talking about today is equity crowdfunding. And this has to do with the uh, ability to buy an ownership right in a company or to uh, provide a loan to a company. And, and these are ones that depend upon an ongoing relationship where you're going to give money to the company today and you're going to expect to get some money back in the future. And because of this, this, these characteristics, it's called a security. It is regulated by state and, and federal government. And uh, uh, all these rules come into play. But this is a different type of investment because you're giving that small business as an investor time to work with the money to make it grow in value. And, and everything works out the way it's supposed to. Uh, the small business is going to pay back the investor more money than they received uh, in the form of interest or in the share of profits or in the share of, of revenues. And, and this gives the investor the chance to, to make more money than they started with. Uh, the general common uh, aspects of any, any investment. And, and this is a good thing because it changes how uh, the investor and the company are working together. Uh, it allows for that company to get that early stage seed capital that may not be available uh, from a bank uh, because it's too risky or from an angel investor because it's too small uh, or any a, a number of other reasons. And, and so crowdfunding uh, is one of many choices that a small business or entrepreneur may have in how they go about raising capital. And, and so uh, it's very important uh, to know one that it exists as an opportunity, a uh, different way of raising capital, and because it uh, largely is, is going to change maybe how you think about your customers. Um, what you will commonly see in an equity crowdfunding campaign is that your investor candidates your, are your customers. And customers are one type of a stakeholder, as we talk about it in the motivated money approach. And uh, the net of that is that um, you're going to go to a person who either is currently buying your products or services or someone you would like to become a customer uh, and begin buying your products or services. And you're going to say to them, hey, if you like what I'm doing as a business, if you want my company to continue to provide these products or services or to grow its ability to provide these products or services, then why don't you consider making an investment in my company? And um, there are lots of different uh, stories, videos, uh, other types of programs out there that refer to the customer as an investor and talk about how great it is when a customer places their money with a small business as an investment. But at, at this point, uh, this is where my thinking diverges. Uh, it takes a different path than what you'll, you'll commonly see when people talk about crowdfunding and customers as investors. And, and, and the fact of the matter is that um, the average person on the street uh, does not think of themselves as an investor. I, I joke that if I walked into a coffee shop 
and shouted out investors, investors, nobody would turn around because they don't identify with, they don't use that label. They don't look at themselves as investors. Um, they're just people. And, and uh, unlike a lot of angel investors who go around with uh, investor tattooed on their forehead because it's a social status for them uh, in um, proving to everybody how wealthy they are and, and how uh, privileged you may be to receive their investment dollars, um, the customer is, is actually thinking of the business almost entirely from the perspective of what do you sell to me? What do I buy? Uh, how valuable do I see, see your product or service? Uh, and as a consequence, um, they're thinking product, 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 uh, or service, service, service. And, uh, and so uh, when you go to them and you start referring to them as investors, you, you create confusion in their mind because they're, they're thinking, hey, uh, yeah, I've got a little money. I might put my money with you as an investment, but that's really not what's driving my investment decision. I'm thinking about your product. Um, and um, most small businesses uh, in particular can't offer a high rate of return on their investment because they have low profit margins. They're not gonna grow uh, 400, 500% year over year for the next 20, 40 years. Uh, they're not going to become the next Google or Amazon or Facebook. And, and so uh, as a consequence, they cannot go around touting themselves, you know, uh, claiming, hey, look, invest in me and I'm going to make you rich. Now, some small businesses may still try to do that. But quite frankly, that's, that's a very limited statistic. It's not one even hardly worth talking about. So we're not going to do that. Um, what we're, we're talking about is that, however, that if you invest in this business, um, they will become a continuing supplier of products and services that you may commonly purchase. And if I'm thinking about this then as a business, and I'm thinking about the mindset of my customer as an investor, I have to start changing around how I work with them, how I communicate with them, and most importantly, how I'm going to structure my offer to them, what's going to entice them to make an investment in my company. And, and, and this is where most crowdfunding campaigns uh, and, and most of the, the crowdfunding platforms that support them uh, fall down because they, they treat this like any other form of investment where the only thing that's on the table is a potential rate of return on a business and this doesn't work very well for most small businesses because they are small, low margins, low rates of return, uh, high uncertainty about their ability to perform, and, uh, and so on. So if I go to a customer and say, hey, why don't you give me $100? And I'm going to pay you back more than $100 of an unknown amount sometime in the unknown future, and um, and it's very uncertain, and I have no idea what's going to come out of this, but you should give me money because I'm a small bu business and somehow I'm entitled or privileged to raise money from you. Uh, they're going to turn you down. Uh, they, they would rather take that $100 and buy a Powerball ticket this weekend, whereby uh, within two or three days, they'll know whether they won or lost. Uh, they certainly have little interest in making a speculative investment in something that may or may not ever pay back um, sometime in the in distant future. So as you're, you're talking with, um, as a small business and raising money from your customers, you need to start uh, merging the concept of equity crowdfunding with uh, what we call rewards crowdfunding something like you might see on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, uh, where uh, you're going to get back a product or service in exchange for your money. Now, what I do is I, I recommend and help my clients uh, put together packages that are a combination of products and services and equity or a loan or a rev share, some other form of security, and it becomes a combination package. And this combination package 
uh, is expected to uh, become on a great enough incentive to elevate the motivation of the person to make an investment. So, so uh, by doing it in this manner, I'm now addressing the needs and concerns of my prospective investor candidate by talking to them about what they want to talk about and, and doing it uh, by talking about products and services that my company is selling. Now, think about it this way. If, if I uh, ask somebody for $100 and, and within that $100, I give back to them, say, $50 of products and services, um, and uh, then they, the investor knows that at that point in time, they're getting something of value for their money. And that value is, and, and, and the example I've just provided is not equal to the dollar amount of their investment, but it represents a significant portion of that. And, and, and this way, uh, the customer is seeing the value of the product or service, and they're also getting equity or some kind of security, uh, which will, may give them some additional payback of their investment in the future. And this combination starts changing the mindset from I'm making, uh, I'm, I'm throwing my money at this business and hoping I get something back to I'm putting money on the table and I'm, I am getting something back. Uh, and in this combination, uh, now the mindset changes and the customer is, is considering with some serious uh, hopefulness that they're going to put money into the business and something good is going to come out of this. But we can do better than that. And, and so as I work with businesses and putting together uh, capital campaigns and structuring the deal, the offer that they're going to make to investor candidates, within a crowdfunding uh, campaign, uh, you wanna see what you can do to stack the deck, uh, to put more things of value into this combination package so that the product is the dominant reason why they're going to make the investment and the equity or the upside potential in the future is a secondary uh, element, maybe even not even that important, uh, and uh, becomes almost like a bonus uh, if it ever happens. And, and now we're talking to the customer in language they understand. So um, as an example, going back to this customer where I say, give me $100 and I'll give you $50 a product, and I'm going to give you stock that we're, we're going to value at $100. Uh, now I'm going to say, well, what if, what if we uh, do this combination where I'm going to give you some product or I'm going to give you discount coupons? And a discount coupon uh, is simply a, a contractual commitment to sell a product to a customer sometime in the future at less than the ordinary retail value. Uh, and uh, the coupon uh, is typically transferable, which meaning that it can give, be given to someone else for them to use. Um, and it, it doesn't have an expiration date on it. It can be used pretty much at any time. And um, so now if I go to the customer and say, ordinarily you would buy a product from me, but I'm gonna give you coupons with discounts. And the value of the coupons collectively in the aggregate is $100. So if you were going to buy my products anyway, uh, and you use all these coupons, you're going to save $100 of uh, discounts uh, on those purchases. And so when I ask you to invest in my company today and give me $100, you're thinking, well, this is kind of like a prepayment. Uh, and it is. It's a form of investment where your customer is making an advance payment on future products to be purchased, and they're making the money available to you today for you to use um, when uh, they're going to be making their purchases and exercising these coupons somewhere down the road. This is a, a kind of a super customized type of micro investment. Uh, under the motivated money approach, we, we look at anything that puts cash or other capital resources in your hands today that uh, is paid back or realized somewhere down the road because 
moving money to today is kind of part of the process of a time machine in, in raising capital where uh, you need resources today to build and grow your business. And if you can defer uh, paying that money back till somewhere in the future, whether it's two weeks or uh, two years or 20 years, uh, you have gained the use of those resources for a period of time, which hopefully will be long enough for you to convert that into something of greater value out of which you can share profits or pay interest, or in this case, uh, give up discounts on uh, product or in service purchases. So uh, now we're at a point where we're talking with our customers saying, hey, if you invest $100, uh, I'm going to give you at least $100 worth of discount coupons. You could even sweeten this deal and give them $200 worth of discount coupons. And, uh, and you may even be able to stack up as many coupons as you need to until your customer reaches a point where they're going, this is actually something that makes so much sense. It's so good for me. Um, it is, is what I sometimes call a no-brainer decision. I give this uh, company $100. I get $200 or $500 of discount coupons. Uh, I'm ahead of the game. I'm making a return on my investment in the form of discounts that far exceeds anything I might get from the success of this company in the form of paying me back interest or a share of future profits. And, and in some ways, they're, they're getting a two for or doubling down on their benefits. And, and this is what um, the motivated money approach uh, looks at is that commonly an investor has a single way of looking at a company when they make an investment, which is how much money they're going to get in the future above and beyond their original investment. And as good as that motivation may be for them to make an investment, uh, unfortunately, it's often not enough. And, and part of the reason it's not enough is there's so many other businesses that are offering them similar types of deal structures. With the motivated money approach, where we are focused upon uh, things outside of the return on investment, we have the chance to, to find benefits that are great enough to motivate that investor candidate to come to the table and make an investment. And as we're talking about here today in crowdfunding and specifically focused on upon customers as the investor candidates that we're trying to pitch, we're saying, what kind of a deal can I make with my products or services that puts me in a better place today, uh, cash-wise, capital-wise, and at the same time is good for uh, my customers enough that they're going to part with their more scarce money because these are non-wealthy individuals. They have less discretionary spending. In fact, you may be talking to them about um, investing in your company out of money that they've set aside to buy this particular product or service uh, sometime in the future. So you're, you're making this kind of, of offer in a way that they understand, which recognizes and respects them as an investor candidate. You're talking to them as a customer, not as an investor. So um, the language is something they can understand. And then the deal is, is one in which they can easily place a value on this uh, offer of yours uh, without it overwhelming their understanding of buying your particular product. And if they do make more money in the future, if you do have a cash exit, uh, you get acquired and sold, or you distribute money uh, to this investor, uh, in some other way beyond the benefit they're getting out of buying your products or services, then it is a bonus. It is an extra uh, thing, and they'll all be very happy about that. But they don't stay up late at night worrying about, you know, what did I do? Why did I make that investment? Why did I give these people my money? Because um, they have gotten value out of their investment. And that value is realizable today, meaning that they could take that whole stack of coupons that they that you just gave them and walk into your store and buy the product or service and use all these products 
and, and now they realize that discount immediately. And, and so that's an instant form of gratification as opposed to a long-term speculative, I don't know when I'm going to get my money back kind of a speculation. And uh, so this changes the entire tone, the entire tenor uh, of how you work with this type of investor candidate. And, and you're able to do this within this uh, heavily regulated uh, type of investment structure called equitable crowdfunding. And um, so it, it gives you so many more options now uh, as to where and how you go about raising your money. Now, crowdfunding uh, is not simple. It, it's complex and it can take time. Uh, the, the reason for the complexity is that you need to go out and tell your story, that is make your offer, your pitch to a large, large number of people in order to uh, get the number of investors you need to reach your capital goals. And, and most small businesses have a very difficult time, uh, one, either uh, having a crowd already in place and ready to go, so they just reach out and tell them about this offering. And, and so it requires a more operational expense, more back office infrastructure, uh, typically putting into place a customer relation management type of software to help them uh, track and organize uh, customers who become investors uh, and uh, to follow them through this change in their relationship. Um, and, um, and so uh, without this in place, this, this can become very uh, overwhelming. It's hard to take an Excel spreadsheet and keep track of a large number of customers uh, who then become investors or, or prospective customers who become investors. Um, but um, software is out there that uh, can speed the process, make this all more efficient, but it's one more thing that a small business may not have that it needs to do if it's gonna take advantage of this way to, to raising capital. Now, a um, couple other thoughts though, if you're a small business and you are now uh, seriously looking at raising capital and thinking of your customers as the highest priority, the ones who are most likely to invest in your, your particular uh, company, um, keep in mind that uh, one of the things that you may get out of this is you may want to treat your crowdfunding campaign uh, more as a marketing or sales campaign than a raising capital campaign. Uh, and by this, meaning that uh, one of your goals here may be to increase your customers, build your brand, make yourself better known to people and increase your sales. And doing it through the mechanism of a crowdfunding campaign is one of the ways of making that happen. And, and that means that instead of spending so much money uh, over here out of one bucket, trying to make customers aware of who you are and then uh, taking money out of a different bucket to try to identify, qualify, and sell investor candidates, these two buckets can be brought together and you can use the same money to achieve both outcomes. And that changes, uh, again, the way you may look at raising capital because building customers and making more sales uh, is clearly your primary objective and raising capital is only done as necessary to give you the money you need to go back to doing what you wanted to do, which is selling more customers. And uh, so it, uh, it rethinks uh, how you set your budgets, how you may use your money. You may be able to pull a lot of the uh, promotional material you've put together for selling your products and services and bring it over and apply it almost as you had it to uh, helping raise money through investors who are your customers. And finally, uh, one of the other thoughts that you should be looking at as a small business in raising money from your customers is that uh, your customer and you have a relationship uh, where they're expecting a product service of a certain quality uh, and that's pretty much how they see and value you. 
unfortunately, in that mindset, a customer may also feel that same way about one of your competitors, and they may find that, yeah, I bought it, um, this particular candy bar from Joe today, but I'm going to buy that candy bar tomorrow from Sally. And they consider your products and services interchangeable or substitutable for similar products sold by some of your competitors. There's not a lot of what we call customer loyalty at this point because they just don't feel that strong of a relationship. But once they become an investor in your company and once they understand that uh, they may benefit from the success of your company, uh, what we commonly see is this heightened, elevated customer loyalty that where before they, they may have bought that second candy bar from Sally, but today uh, they're going, no, I have an ownership in this company. I'm going to make all of my purchases from this company. And uh, that way uh, I'm actually going to elevate my sales. I'm going to tip over sales that otherwise might have gone to one of my competitors. And that's a good thing. Um, that means that I don't have to spend as much money on marketing and sales because they already know me and I already have a brand awareness with that customer. Another thing that can come out of a crowdfunding campaign is that you may take a customer, uh, basically convert them into becoming an investor. Now you've got two relationships with them. Uh, but uh, you may also be able to take that same uh, customer and uh, give them an additional responsibility of being an advocate for your company to go out and share uh, information about your products or services to sing your praises to everyone within their networks and, and use this as a mechanism also to increase uh, your sales. So uh, once a person uh, is a customer, uh, you can pitch them uh, to become an investor. But once they become an investor, then you also want to put together uh, marketing promotional packages that you can send to each of your investors uh, where they can talk about you to everybody they know. And, and they do this. Um, they should do this. I, I We'll clarify, they should do this because they have an ownership stake in the company and they want to help themselves by helping the company. But here again, you may be able to put some incentives into this, like a, an affiliate fee or sales rep fee uh, that gives them that extra push to serve as an advocate. And uh, this is one of the things I like about crowdfunding, uh, where uh, fully utilized, fully optimized, you were talking about investor who are wearing three hats. They are a customer who's buying your products or services. They have given you money to build and grow your business, but they're also serving as an advocate, a promoter of your company to help drive more sales of your products and services. This is what I call the trifecta or the, the most elegant, most uh, uh, optimal form of um uh, working and building a relationship because now you're getting multiple benefits from a single relationship. Uh, that means your your company is 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 uh, optimized as much as possible, as efficient in running uh, because um, you're getting extra benefit out of each relationship you establish. And the more customers you have like this, who are now fans of your business who um, are, are, are no um, less enthused than, than you may see people who are watching the World Cup games or, or following any other major sport. Uh, this is an army uh, that you have that is an asset uh, to you in the conduct of your business, which allows you to, to do things better, quicker, faster. And it just generally uh, helps your entire organization. So um, um, what we've gone through here today in this episode of Motivated Money um, is the concept of crowdfunding, uh, which is, as I described, a regulated approach to raising money. And most commonly, this money is going to be raised from customers. 
And we've talked through the fact that your customers don't view themselves as investors. They are simply customers, but you can put together offering packages that include a sale of security along with products or product discounts uh, that give them this great benefit from making the investment and cause them to make uh, their, their very scarce money available to you uh, for you to build and grow your business. And uh, this opens up all kinds of, of possibilities, uh, as we've talked about, in uh, trying to have these people become part of your team uh, to help uh, promote your company, your business, and expand your sales uh, by reaching out and, and working within their network of friends and family and associates uh, to tell them about who you are and what you're doing. And uh, as you're managing this and you're communicating with them, you will have a higher cost of operation, but this cost uh, should be readily offset by an increase in sales without a corresponding increase in the cost of sales. And um, there, there's a chance here that this could all work out wonderfully. And um, so as I indicated earlier, uh, we're going to have uh, some guests on future episodes of the Motivated Money podcast who are in the, the process or preparing to raise capital through an equitable crowdfunding campaign. I'm also going to try to get on the managers of one or more of these crowdfunding platforms who can share a little bit more about uh, what they do and how they work as a intermediary um, that is a, a platform that exists between you and people you don't know uh, to bring them on board and help make them investors in your company. And, um, and so uh, this is uh, uh, yet one more way of raising capital. Uh, I know many, I'm gonna share as many of these as possible with you in future episodes. And, um, uh, leave you with uh, you know uh, appreciation and thank you uh, for listening to this episode of Motivated Money. Uh, if you would like to learn more about the Motivated Money approach, uh, possibly even sitting in in one of my future uh, boot camps, uh, you can go to the website http uh, colon backslash uh, motivated dot money and get more information about all of this. Um, this would be very easy to flash up on the screen, but doing it uh, to a listening audience, I'm, I'm still working on developing my, my capabilities in that regard. Um, so that's it for today. This is Carl Dakin with the Motivated Money Podcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening in to Motivated Money. If you like this, or any other episodes, make sure to leave a rating and review the show. We love to hear your feedback and want to make this the best possible show for you. Also, if you like this episode, make sure you share it with someone you know who is seeking to raise capital. They will appreciate learning what you now know about raising funding. I'll see you on the next episode of Motivated Money.